The Demon's Behavior Generally the demon does all he cannot to be discovered. He does not like to talk and tries everything to discourage both the exorcist and the possessed. Experience has taught me that this behavior follows four steps, prior to discovery, during exorcisms, at the beginning of liberation, and after liberation. I must caution that there are never two identical instances. The behavior of the evil one is most unpredictable and takes many different forms. What I am about to describe refers to the most frequently encountered behavior. 1. Prior to discovery. Demonic possession causes physical and mental disturbances. Therefore the possessed is usually under a doctor's care, and nobody suspects the true nature of the problems. Often doctors try to cure the symptoms for a lengthy period and try many drugs, always with very limited results. Commonly, the patient goes from doctor to doctor, accusing them of incompetence. Mental symptoms are the hardest to cure, many times the specialists find nothing wrong, although this also happens often with physical illness, and often the family accuses the possessed individual of imagining his problems. This is one of the heaviest crosses to bear for these patients, they are neither understood nor believed. Almost always, after fruitlessly searching for help from official medicine, these individuals knock at the door of healers, or, worse, sorcerers, seers, and witch doctors. In this manner, the problems increase. Normally, anyone who comes to the exorcist, following a friend's suggestion, very rarely a priest's advice, has already knocked at every doctor's door and is thoroughly skeptical, many times he has tried sorcerers and warlocks. Often an inexcusable lack of ecclesiastical care in this field is added to the lack of faith or the lack of practice in the faith of these individuals, the result is an understandable delay in turning to the exorcist. We must remember that even in the cases of complete possession, that is, in cases when the demon is the one talking and acting, using the victim's body, the demon does not act consistently. He alternates periods of activity, usually called moments of crisis, with unpredictable periods of rest. In this manner, with few exceptions, the person is able to function and hold a job or go to school in a seemingly normal manner. The person alone knows the tremendous effort that the performance of these tasks requires. 2. During exorcisms. At the beginning the demon tries his best to remain undetected or at least to hide the seri, usness of his possession, even if he is not always successful. At times he is forced by the strength of the exorcism to reveal his presence at the first prayers, other times more sessions are required before he is discovered. I remember a young man who, at the first blessing, gave only a mild, negative reaction. I thought, this is an easy one, I will be done after this blessing and a few more. The second time, though, he became furious, and after that I could not begin an exorcism unless four strong men were present to subdue him. On other occasions, one must wait for the hour of God. I clearly remember one person who had consulted several exorcists, including myself, without any indication of an evil presence. Finally, one time the demon was forced to reveal himself, and after that the exorcisms proceeded fruitfully. Sometimes, from the first or second blessing the demon reveals all his strength, which changes from person to person. At times the revelation is progressive, some possessed appear to have a different sickness at each session, giving the impression that every ill in the body must be brought out one at a time in order to be healed. The demon reacts, in various manners, to prayers and injunctions. Many times he tries to appear indifferent, in reality he suffers and continues to suffer increasingly until liberation is achieved. Some possessed individuals are silent and immobile, and, if provoked, any reaction is limited to the eyes. Others fling themselves about, and unless they are held down, they harm themselves. Others wail, especially if a stole is pressed to the affected parts of their bodies, as the ritual suggests, or if they are blessed with the sign of the cross or with holy water. Very few are violent, and these must be held tightly by those who are helping the exorcist or by their relatives. Demons are very reluctant to speak. The ritual, very rightly, admonishes the exorcist not to ask questions out of curiosity, but to ask only what is useful for liberation. The first thing that must be asked is the name. For the demon, who is so reluctant to reveal himself, revealing himself is a defeat, even when he has revealed his name, he is always reluctant to repeat it, even during following exorcisms. 
Then we command the evil one to tell how many demons are present in a particular body. There can be many or few, but there is always one chief, and he is always the first to be named. When the demon has a biblical name or one given in tradition, for example, Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, Zebulun, Meridian, Asmodeus, we are dealing with heavyweights, tougher to defeat. The degree of difficulty is also relative to the intensity with which the demon possesses a person. When several demons are present, the chief is always the last to leave. The strength of possession is manifested also from the reaction of the demon to holy names. Generally the evil one does not and cannot say those names, he substitutes expressions such as, he, referring to God or Jesus, or, she, referring to Our Lady. Other times he says, your boss, or, your lady, to indicate Jesus or Mary. If the possession is very strong and the demon is high ranking, I repeat that demons keep the rank that they held when they were angels, such as thrones, principalities, or dominions, then it is possible for him to say the name of God and Mary, always followed by horrible blasphemies. Some believe, I know not why, that demons are talkative and that, if they are present during an exorcism, the demon will publicly denounce all their sins. It is a false belief, demons are reluctant to speak, and when they talk, they say silly things to distract the exorcist and escape his questions. There are exceptions. One day Father Candido invited a priest who prided himself on his skepticism to be present during an exorcism. The priest accepted the invitation, but his behavior was disparaging, he stood with his arms crossed, without praying, as all who are present should do, and with an ironic smile. At one point, the demon turned to him, saying, You say that you do not believe I exist. But you believe in women, yes, you believe in women, and how? That poor unfortunate priest, quietly and walking backward, reached the door and quickly disappeared. Another time the demon disclosed sins to discourage the exorcist. Father Candido was exorcising a hand some young man who was possessed by a great beast of a demon. Trying to discourage the exorcist, the demon said, Can't you see that you are wasting your time? This one never prays. He goes around with and does, and there followed a long list of ugly sins. At the end of the exorcism, Father Candido fruitlessly tried to convince that young man to make a general confession. It was necessary almost to drag him into the confessional, where he hastened to say that he had no sins to confess. Then Father Candido asked, but did you not do this and such? Dumbfounded, the poor man was forced to admit his transgressions. As the confessor continued with the list of sins, the young man admitted every one of the facts revealed by the demon. After receiving absolution, the young man left, mumbling, I don't understand anything anymore. If you like this video, please help me by hitting the like button, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell, so you will not miss any new videos like this. These priests know everything. The ritual suggests asking other questions dealing with the length of time of possession, the motive, and similar topics. I will mention later how we must behave in case of spells, and what questions to ask. Let us not forget that the demon is the prince of lies. He freely accuses one person or another to foster suspicion and enmity, his answers must be sifted carefully. I will say only that generally questioning the demons is not of great importance. For instance, often when the demon sees he is losing strength, he gives one date as the day of his departure but then lingers on. An experienced exorcist such as Father Candido was often able to guess not only what kind of demon he was dealing with but also often even his name, therefore he did not ask too many questions. At times, however, he would ask the demon's name only to be told, you know it already. Which was true. In cases of strong possessions the demon might speak voluntarily to discourage the exorcist. Many times, I was told, you cannot do anything against me. This is my home, I am happy here, and here I will stay. You are wasting your time. Other times, I was threatened, I will eat your heart. Tonight I will frighten you so much that you will not be able to close your eyes. I will come into your bed like a snake. I will throw you out of bed. Then, confronted with my answers, he would fall silent. For instance, when I say, I am enveloped within the mantle of Our Lady. What can you do to me, or, the Archangel Gabriel is my protector, try and fight him, 
or my guardian angel watches over me so that I won't be touched, you cannot harm me, the demon remains silent. The exorcist is always able to find a particularly weak spot. Some demons cannot bear to have the sign of the cross traced with a stole on an aching part of the body, some cannot stand a puff of breath on the face, others resist with all their strength against blessing with holy water. Then there are certain sentences within the prayers of exorcism to which the demon reacts with violence or by losing strength. At this point, as the ritual suggests, the exorcist will repeat those sentences. The session's duration varies according to the judgment of the priest. Often the presence of a doctor is useful not only to give the initial diagnosis, but also to help deter, mind the length of the exorcism. When the obsessed or the exorcist is feeling poorly, the doctor is the one who advises when to end the session. The exorcist also is able to determine when it is useless to go any farther. 3. Nearing the exit of the demon. This is a delicate and difficult moment, which could also take a long time. Sometimes the demon indicates that he has lost strength, but in other circumstances he tries to launch the last attacks. In the case of a common sickness, we often notice that the patient progresses gradually until he is well again. In the case of possession, on the other hand, most frequently the opposite happens, the individual often feels increasingly worse, and when he cannot stand it any longer he is healed. For a demon, to leave a body and go back to hell, where he is almost always condemned, means to die forever and to lose any ability to molest people actively. He expresses this desperation during exorcisms with words such as these, I am dying, I am dying. I can't take it any longer. Enough, you are killing me. You are murderers, hangmen. All priests are murderers. And similar sentences. Whereas at the beginning of the exorcisms he would say, you cannot do anything to me, now he says, you are killing me, you have won. At the beginning he would say that he would never leave, because he was perfectly happy in a particular body, now he claims he feels ill and wants to leave. It is a fact that every exorcism is like hitting the demon with a bat. He suffers greatly, at the same time he also causes pain and weakness to the person he possesses. He even admits that he is better off in hell than during an exorcism. One time, while Father Candido was exorcising one person close to liberation, the demon openly told him, do you think that I would leave if this were not worse than the suffering of hell? Exorcisms had become truly unbearable to him. We must keep something else in mind to help the person who is nearing his liberation, the demon tries to communicate his feelings to the possessed. The demon can't take it any longer, and he communicates this condition of desperation to his victim, he feels near the end of his life, unable to reason rationally, and transmits the same feeling of madness and of near death to the possessed. How often these people beg me, tell me truly, am I crazy? Exorcisms become more difficult also for the victim, and if someone does not almost force him to keep the appointment he will not go. At times individuals who were near or very near liberation stopped coming to their appointments altogether. These patients must often be helped to pray and to go to church because they cannot do it on their own. They also need help undergoing exorcisms. They must constantly be encouraged, especially during the final stages. Undoubtedly the length of time required before liberation contributes to the discouragement and to the physical exhaustion. The victim feels that his ills are incurable. Sometimes the demon may also cause real sickness, physical but primarily psychological, that must be medically treated after liberation. At other times the healing is complete and requires nothing more. 4. After liberation. It is very important not to decrease prayer, the reception of sacraments, and living a Chris Tien life. An occasional exorcism is also beneficial because it is not unusual for the demon to repeat his at tax, trying to come back, it is well not to give him any openings. We may call this a period of gathering strength to safeguard a successful liberation. Occasionally some of my patients have experienced relapses. When there was no negligence involved, that is, he had maintained an intense spiritual life, the second liberation was easy. However, when the relapse was helped by lack of prayer or, even worse, by falling into habitual sin, the possession was worse than before, just as Matthew 12 43-45 describes. The demon comes back with seven more worse than himself. 
I am sure that by now the reader realizes that the demon tries his best to hide his presence. This is one of the facts that helps to differentiate demonic possession from some psychological problems. In the latter instance usually the patient does his best to attract attention. Conversely, the demon acts very carefully.